be seated. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we're gathered here today in the sight of God and these witnesses to unite Jesse and Ray in holy matrimony. Now, no, I did say holy, and that's not by accident. It's true that in every society and government, there has been an established set of order uh, regarding marriage and some sort of family structure, because such things serve as a microcosm of society at large. In other words, families are the cornerstones of any culture, and as such, they deserve official recognition by that culture and its government for the stability of the whole. Even so, the concept of marriage has been instituted by God. We find in the book of Genesis, we find it in chapter 2, verse 19 through 24, these words. Now the Lord, had, Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and the wild animals. But for Adam, the man, there was no suitable helper to be found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took the man's rib. And he then closed the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from that rib that he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and then they become one flesh. We find that amongst all of creation, Man, when his, man was in need of a lot more than just the animals, and just himself. You see, I believe that God created people for community. And community is a word. It's a conjunction that means common unity. So we were created to have common unity. I once heard it said that a person cannot truly be an individual unless first there was a community of other individuals by which he or she could be juxtaposed to. It's true. While we are all individuals, we still congregate with friends and family, and we gather into towns and cities because there is strength and security and support in numbers. Marriage is the micro of that same principle. And without the smallest, the smallest of foundations, like a marriage, without small foundations performing well, the larger foundations built upon it will crumble. Individuals cannot support the weight of the whole. And in, and in God's wisdom, he chose not to make an identical being to correlate to man. In other words, another man. Because that would carry the same weaknesses and the same individual traits. But God also knew that whoever man is in need of for companionship, that person has to be so distinct Enough distinction that he's not like them, or he or she is not like the animals. So there has to be complementary uh, elements to whoever this companion is to be, but enough difference to make things lively. And that's why the Bible says that God took from man, Adam, a part of his own body and didn't start afresh by creating another man. The person God made has to have the essence of man, but enough distinction to achieve real balance. This companion must fit to man like a puzzle piece, bearing the same complementary strengths to help build a solid foundation while having enough distinction to keep things vibrant and stimulating. This person is as much a part of man as a male is. So when I say man, I'm not referring to masculinity, I'm referring to humanity. Furthermore, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 27, it says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, so that they, so they, may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Note the parallels. God made man, humankind, in his image. It encapsulates both maleness and femaleness. Separate, each only represents half of the full of humanity. 
It is the union in marriage that people truly find what it means to be made in God's image. In Genesis 1.26, we see God speaking of himself as a plurality, despite the fact that God is one God. Christian theology has unpacked this in the form of the Trinity. But in its simplicity, we can simply say that God is so complete in his own relationship with himself that he needs no one else. But man alone is still in need, and woman alone is still in need. But together as one flesh, there's satisfaction. Hence, Genesis 2.24's phrasing of one flesh. It is a return of the woman to her roots, and a union of two into one. Jesus, in Mark chapter 10, verse 9, he quotes that <coughs> verse from Genesis 2.24, but he adds these words. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. If God is one and inseparable, then the ideal for people in marriage should reflect that same kind of relationship. You should not separate. You should achieve unity because you are now one flesh. Your individuality is only made so because you have something to juxtapose to between the two of you. Apart, you're merely just parts missing from the whole. Today, as you marry, you become whole. Sadly, humanity has fallen to the susceptibility of sin. Now, the word sin comes from an archery term. It means to miss the mark. Uh, it's to fail to live according to the standards God has set. It's an arrow flying past the target. The heart of human transgression has always been rooted in selfishness. It is the elevation of individuality over the need for community, over the need for those that we live with and love, that divides us. We are a people at war with ourselves as a species, both internally and externally. But to those gathered here today, Jesse and Ray stand here before you today to challenge those predilections. 